Okay, so I'm going to review like the first three chapters of Frankenstein. Now, I know you guys did presentations, reviewing, and that sort of thing. But sometimes you just want someone to come up here and just tell you exactly what was going on. But more than that, more than just story, I try to pull out themes and ideas that you may not have noticed if you just read it straight out. And um, that helps us to get more out of the novel. I've read the novel many, many times, taught it for many years. Um, even then, I haven't mastered the novel by any means. Um, I'm definitely not a Frankenstein scholar, and I'm sure there's a lot more in there um, that I could pull out. I read Frankenstein on my own. It wasn't assigned to me. I read it. I was an adult. I was actually in the military at the time. I was in Operation um, Roving Sands. And I was out there in the middle of the desert with nothing around except me, my canteen, and the Humvee, and Frankenstein. And I read the novel. All the way. I had nothing else, right? I got through in about two days or so. And then, I, then when I finally got a chance, I looked at the cliff notes. That's what they had back then. And that helped me get a little bit more out of the novel. But even then, reading it another time where I had to teach it in high school, I got stuff that I didn't even catch the first time. So there's so much in this novel. This is just a, a little tiny overview, review, to help us along. I think some of you might have a shaky foundation of the book, and that's going to trouble you in these later chapters. So I want to make sure we're all clear, we're all on the same page, so to speak, as far as the story. So it starts off with the letters, and we have this guy named R. Walton. R. Walton's this character that appears in the beginning, but then Mary Shelley takes him away from us and just a few pages later. So why introduce a character and then take them away? We don't even see him again till the end of the novel. That's kind of strange. I mean, why would somebody do that? Is it because she didn't know what she was doing? Did she change characters all of a sudden? Yeah. Yeah, so what she did is she took the end and kind of put it in the beginning. But why not put it in Victor's perspective or the monsters? Why are Walton? Why is he the one telling the story? Well, simple answer. Now, if Mary Shelley was here, she'd probably give you something different. Maybe she, who knows, right? Oh, well, my uncle told me if I didn't put him in the novel, he was going to beat me. I don't know. <laughs> but I can only speak from an academic standpoint. And that is, he serves as a literary tool, literary device, if you will, to help get the reader acclimated before the strange things begin to occur. See, because it's a historical novel, even in her day, it was taken, the story takes place in the 1700s. She wrote it in 1818. So even in her day, it was considered a, a, a time or a historical piece, historical fiction. Uh, it's a different time period. We have fantastic things that are going to start happening. Eight-foot monsters, for example. All right, well, if you just start off like that, oftentimes the reader can be alienated from the story. And so to get the reader to transition into this special world, we can bring in a character like R. Walton who represents the everyday average guy. Now, you might look at this picture and think of R. Walton and said, he's not the average guy. Well, this is, it's not here, it's not the year 1818. Maybe in Russia, that still is the average guy, right? Maybe. Okay, that was a good point, Sean. Thank you. Oh, I said your name on camera. Sorry. That's not his real name. Okay, but um, anyway, if it was the year 1818, that probably is kind of the average guy. And so he's the one to take us to this special world that Mary Shelley has created. So let's talk a little bit about who is this average guy. He's a passionate man who is an explorer. Now his particular case, he wants to go to the North Pole and he wants to find out the secrets to the compass, the 
wants to understand the magnetic properties. Why is this thing always point north? Hey, let's go north and find out. Okay, well, it's not about the North Pole. It's not about the compass. That's not what Mary Shelley's trying to get at. What she's getting at is that sometimes there are questions in life that should remain unanswered. Sometimes in the pursuit of truth, people are going to get hurt. And that's a claim that Mary Shelley proposes in her novel. Are there questions that we should remain unanswered? For example, do I really need to know what's in my chicken McNugget? <laughs> do I really need to know what kind of meat it is it or what mixture of meat? I don't want to know. I just want to go through the drive through get my chicken nuggets, get my chipotle sauce, and I'm good to go. Or I'll get the barbecue and the honey and I mix them together. And kind of honey barbecue thing going on. I don't really want to know what they're made out of. Now I know there's a documentary that came out that shows you exactly what they're made out of. And the people who watched it, the people who watched it probably never have chicken nuggets again. I don't want to watch that. I don't want to know the truth. I just want my nuggets. <laughs> okay, well, in the same way, there are other questions in life that we should probably just leave alone. Like, in this case, the compass, the North Pole. Back then, nobody had been there. Do we really need to keep going north? I mean, come on. It works. It gets me from point A to point B. I don't have to know why it points north. But R. Walton, if he can find out, can be written down in history, make a name for himself. So this is his great pursuit. We then see in letters two through three, he continues the, this adventure. He finally goes up north, so north that the water gets frozen and his ship gets stuck in the ice. What we've done, what Mary Shelley's done, is created an excellent area for us to tell a very long story, which is the novel that you have in your hands. So, R. Walton's there, and his only job right now is to keep warm. And hopefully the, um, the weather will change and the ice will melt just enough that the ship can start moving again. But this is huge. It's not like, hey guys, get out of the back and start pushing. You just don't do that with a big boat like this. You guys just got to wait. You're stuck. And it's not like you're going to walk back home either. You guys have no idea how big this earth is. I know because I've driven through Texas. When you're driving for eight hours going almost 90, I'm sorry, going 85 miles an hour. You're driving 85 miles an hour for eight hours straight and you're still in Texas. <laughs> you realize this place is huge. This little bubble that you guys live in, this little root, it's like this tiny little speck of dust it's a small world. compared to how big this world is. Sometimes, like, well, sometimes people are like, oh, it's a small world because you see someone from over here, you guys meet up in the same place, right? Yeah. <laughs> so just imagine this. Just think of this. If it took me eight hours going... 85 miles per hour, straight shot on a highway in Texas. Imagine the people who walked across Texas. Texas is, just Texas alone is huge. Now, never mind the North Pole, where there's not a single gas station for who knows. There's no, like, Quickie Mart. There's no phone line. There's no cell phone signal. Anyway, in letters two through three, um, he's stuck on the ice. Okay, so... He says this quote, love for the marvelous, a belief in the marvelous. What does that mean? Hmm. Well, let's get an idea of what the North Pole actually looks like. If you were to go to the North Pole, this is the North Pole. Wow, so this is not computer generated. This is a photo of the North Pole. Now, man, can you imagine somebody who, an explorer like him, finding such a site. What a gift, right? 
he's seen something that very few people will ever see. And this is just a photo. You don't get to see the northern lights, the aurora, yeah. the lights that shimmer in the sky. It's like just unbelievable. You think you're on, you're on another planet. And so this is that pursuit of beauty. It's worth it for beauty to find such an amazing thing. And so now when we go back and read the quote, love for the marvelous, a belief in the marvelous, we understand where R. Walton's coming from. But remember, he represents the common man. He's not our main character. So let's get our main character into the story. So we now go to letter four. In the fourth letter, they find a sled and some dogs and someone in the sled. Now, we don't know who's in the sled. That's the reason why I have Santa Claus in here. It could be. We don't know. That's the point. The next day, R. Walton goes out on his ship and uh, probably checking to see if any of the ice melted, you know. And uh, kind of like checking in your freezer, you know, to see if the drink froze yet, you know. So he goes out and checks, and he sees the sled again, but some dead dogs this time. And he finds this emaciated drifter, wanderer. It's kind of like, don't you think it's odd? You're in the North Pole, and you see a homeless guy walking by your boat? <laughs> I mean, doesn't something strike you as, that's weird. I mean, the guy looks like just a homeless beggar, just walking across the North Pole. Hey, how's it going? What's up? <laughs> so anyway, he brings him on board. And we find out that this emaciated beggar is Victor Frankenstein. <laughs> And that's how we go into chapter one. And Victor is telling R. Walton, I'm here to warn you. Because R. Walton's so happy about his little adventure. I'm going to go to the North Pole, man. We'll find the secret to the compass and all that. And, you know, Victor's just like, wait a second. How many men have you lost so far? And Victor realizes the cost of answering the questions of science. And he wants to warn R. Walton in the same way Mary Shelley is warning us to be careful the questions we seek to answer. So, chapter one begins with Victor Frankenstein's narrative, which is perfect because no one's got anywhere to go. Captive audience, we're stuck in the ice. So, since we have such a long journey ahead of us, Victor Frankenstein decides, decides to start at the beginning. I mean, we're talking beginning beginning like before he was born it would be like if you guys were wandering or hitchhiking or something which you should never do it'd be like if you're hitchhiking and someone picked you up in the truck and they said so tell me um you know how did you get around these here parts well let me start from the beginning one day my mom and dad met it's like, oh my goodness, this is going to be a long story. You haven't even started, usually people might start with, well, I was born in, no, he started even before that, right? So, we get to find out all about Victor's parents. His dad, his name's Alfonso, Alfonso, people want to say Alfonso, but he was not Mexican. Alfonso, and... Um, his best friend, Buford, they were buddies, you know? Like, I don't know, Beavis and Butthead or something. You know, a couple buddies there. And his best friend dies. Well, his best friend had a young daughter. Young little girl. And for the honor of his best friend, he takes in his daughter so he can look after her. See, guys, people don't always get married just because of this passionate romance. If you think that's life, you've seen too much of that show, The Bachelor. Okay, where you get to pick, like, out of 20 people who you feel is this, it just makes you just feel so gooey inside. You know, a lot of times people get married for other reasons. And in this case, it was to take care of this young girl. Now, He's not going to be like her dad. It's better to have a husband-wife relationship. He can care for her much and much better and for life. 
It's like this lifetime commitment to care for her. Well, I guess things kind of work out, and a little romance starts building. And uh, I know that. How do I know? Because a little kid comes out later. So he did something right. <laughs> so here comes little uh, Victor Frankenstein, um, the son of this young girl and the dad. And, um, you know, so here's your happy little family. Now, she was a young girl, so she probably wanted to see the world. And, you know, dad's probably, you know, 20 years older. He's like, uh, he just wants to sit down and smoke his, you know, well, um, have, some, have some root beer. <laughs> okay. Well, you know, wants to make the wife happy, take the kid on a nice little family trip. They didn't have Disneyland back then. So they just went around Europe, which is pretty awesome. So they went on a family trip to Italy. And there I have little Victor, you know, <laughs> hanging out with his parents right there. And, um, and they're just checking it out, right? It's really awesome, really cool. Well, as they're wandering the streets, you know, of Italy, um, the mom sees this little girl. And what makes her different, this little girl? She has blonde hair. And the other girls around her all have dark hair. So something about her was this sort of angelic, and she stood out in a crowd. And so the mom, being an orphan herself, sees the desperation in this little girl and takes her in to their family. And so now we have... We have Alphonse and his young wife, little Victor, and now little Elizabeth. <laughs> He's not a girl. That's, no, that's an actual picture of a little boy during that time period. Yeah. Okay, so you got this little girl now. Now, do you guys remember the test question? She was presented as his, his present, yeah. Here's a, you know, some of you guys want an Xbox. He got um, a person, <laughs> a playmate, if you will. And so they played. Now, the mom had every intention for them to actually get married someday. It's kind of a little prearranged marriage. And, uh, you know, they're going to be lifelong friends. In the mom's mind, what an ideal situation, right? So they grow up, and we now go into chapter 2, where we fast forward to much later. They're more like your age in chapter 2. That little girl isn't a little girl anymore. She's a young lady. And Victor, he's the guy who looks real serious over there, um, looking off into the distance. That's Victor. And uh, he's a serious kind of guy. And they have a friend, a neighbor down the street named Henry Clerval. And Henry comes over, and they all hang out, the three of them. And they just, you know, throw popcorn at each other. And um, Henry's real playful. He's like, let's play knights in armor and kill the dragon. And Victor's real serious, scientific kind of guy. You know, so there's the dynamic. And then Elizabeth's just sort of negotiating between the two of them. And it's a real happy little, little group, right? The little inner circle, if you will. Um, now, kids didn't go to school the way you do. Most people just stayed at home. Uh, sometimes you could get a tutor if you were rich. Other than that, your education was whatever dad had on his bookshelf. Hopefully he's got good books. Um, dad usually had a Bible. The Bible was the textbook for many centuries. You learned to read and write, and as well as all the morals that are in there, and learned to be a good God-fearing citizen. Um, so, I'm sure they read those kind of books, but Victor one day, being the young teen, being the curious sort, finds a book in his dad's bookshelf. The book is huge. <laughs> okay? It's, it's a medieval book. And um, there's some interesting ideas that he hasn't seen before. And he starts looking at all this medieval literature. Just like we did in this class, right? First semester. 
he starts looking at Canterbury Tales and Dante's Inferno and some other... Actually, no, he doesn't read literature. He reads science journals. The problem is they're all about 300 years out of date. The, the science in there is all wrong. Like, for example, they believe, the medieval scientists believe that the Earth is the center of the universe. Um, they also believe... Uh, most of the scientists back then weren't trying to find truth. They were trying to make gold. They were called alchemists, and they tried to find any household item to make gold. Of course, they never succeeded. You can only get gold one way, and that's from mining it. But they tried. That would be, like, amazing, right? Never happened. So, yeah, maybe spray paint gold is as close as you're going to get, right? So anyway, Victor's getting educated in the wrong stuff. And that's sort of the beginning of how weird things happen in Victor's life. Okay, so he's got outdated material that he's basing all of his scientific judgment on. Then one day changes his life. He sees a lightning storm and it hits a tree. And he's so amazed by it. It could seem quite magical. But then a friend of the family who is well-educated, I don't even think we know his name, he just shows up and starts talking to Victor saying, hey, this, that's not magic or anything. Marciano, Marciano? Yeah. Marcelino. 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 Yeah. Let's go. <laughs> Have fun. Do you want a late start? Yeah. Yeah. Peace. Peace. Peace out. Sorry, Mr. Wood. You it's okay. You know what you're doing? Yeah. All right, chapters 9 through 12. Okay, oh wait, I'm sorry, 13 through 16. Okay, so um, this guy tells Victor, hey, this is science, man. It's not magical, it's not medieval. I understand why it's, there's lightning, we understand voltage, we, we understand this. And Victor's totally like, what, are you serious? Something as amazing as that, you guys understand? Yeah. Man, come to college. Man, we'll teach you all about real science. And that medieval stuff you've been reading from Dad's bookshelf, it's all out of date, man. You're out of date. You don't know what you're talking about. You need to go to college. So Victor's like, all right, I'm going. So he signs up to go to college. And so he's right about that time in, in his life where you guys are at, ready to go to college. So he goes off to college. Of course, in Chapter 3, his mom passes away. And so when he leaves, it's like, man, that would be tough, right? You're going to take off to college. Let's say you're going to go to college in another state because college for him was quite a distance, especially without modern transportation. So you were to leave the state, and then, you know, your mom passes away, heaven forbid. It's like, man, so he's going to be going to college with a lot on his mind. He goes to Ingolstadt. You have to say it like you're you're mad or angry okay so this is an actual picture of Ingolstadt you can go there it's still in operation so instead of going to RCC go to Ingolstadt <laughs> in Austria I bet you have the time of your life you might not ever want to leave there okay so although it costs a few bucks so you know but it's there it's probably pretty awesome college uh, so he goes to college, and he meets his first uh, teacher there, M. Kremp. And M. Kremp's one of those old-school kind of teachers, but he's all about hardcore science. And he's the one that really shows Victor how off he's been as far as his scientific calculations. Victor is greatly humbled, even a little angry that... The, the real science taught in college is so different than what he grew up with. It's not medieval. Okay, and then he comes across this guy, Waldman. And Waldman's a chemistry teacher. And um, he encourages Victor to go after all of the different sciences. If he really wants to accomplish what he wants to accomplish, which we don't even know what that is yet, if he wants to be a great student of science, he must study all of them. That's what Waldman suggests. Chemistry, biology, astronomy, um, all the science, physics. And so 
it's because of the thinkers back in the 1700s that you guys, this affects you, that when you guys go to college, why you have to take all of the sciences. It goes back to the ideas of the Renaissance, that an educated person should know and have knowledge about all areas of life, science and art. You should have both. That's the difference between someone who goes to a trade school and someone who's educated. You understand how the world operates. And because of that, you can come up with solutions to problems that we don't even know. Problems that don't even exist yet. You'll be well equipped to solve those. You're the pioneers, the innovators. If you only know your one craft, then you're limited, right? So um, that's what's going on in college life. So they basically encourage him, Victor, to go into independent studies. And in independent studies, it's not like in high school, like where you do work packets. No, no, no. In college, independent studies means you sort of choose the courses that you're going to do. Now, don't, ex don't go to UCR and tell them, I want to be independent studies. I mean, you don't get that privilege till you're like way in like grad school, OK? Um, but back then, college was run a little bit differently. So he got to choose his own coursework, and for the most part, be on his own. See, college isn't about getting a grade. It's about, you know, per the pursuit of a certain discipline or knowledge, okay? And that's what Victor does. In chapter 4, we, he's, we see him really messing with um, human anatomy, understanding the process of life and decay. And he actually takes several years. That's what people don't realize, you know, because people watch movies. They think... He just went to college and made a, a creature. It took him years and years and years to study and be in discipline to study human anatomy. And if this grosses you out, you got, can under, understand how a real film of Frankenstein would be pretty graphic. I mean, he's dealing with body parts, really, putting them together. You know, we like to see Frankenstein's monster as this, you know, green guy who walks around. It's really just this biological thing he stitched together. It's much more grotesque than you can imagine, than what we see in films. So, um, actually, this is kind of a scary picture. This is a picture of a coronary bypass. What's that? Um, that's if you guys eat cheeseburgers and fries and soda all the time, and you get or your arteries clogged, and you're going to die. They actually have to... Um, do they have, look, those are stitches, man, and on your heart. You want to get stitches on your heart? I'm done. So it's going to take, man. <laughs> anyway, so he goes after this. Uh, only thing is he's unsupervised. And we have to also remember, now this is, I really brought us to this moment. Because what we see as a guy who's been educated in modern science, but what is his foundation? Medieval science. That's, what's, that's what makes Victor different than all the other scientist students, people. Right? He's got these weird ideas. He, these ideas of extraordinary magic combined with modern science. Now he's dangerous. So he goes off to create this eight-foot being that if he accomplishes it, he feels like he could create a race of superior humans. It's all about being a better human. And he makes one that's eight feet. Now, you guys remember that was one of those test questions. Why did he make him eight feet? Well, because he, yes, he was eight feet. You don't remember that? Oh, maybe I threw it out, I don't know. It was a test question at one time. Uh, well, he's eight feet. Uh, the, why is he eight feet? Because um, he didn't want to work with small little parts. He wanted to. He didn't really know what he was doing. He's never done this, so he wanted to work with manageable, bigger parts. So he'd put huge legs. So he got this eight feet guy, and then the monster's born in chapter five. <laughs> <laughs>